All right, hopefully this goes well because I'm gonna be doing some live demoing and we all know how those things go sometimes. <laughs> uh, welcome to my workshop. Today I'm gonna to be talking about world building in Open 3D Engine. My name's Johnny Galloway. I'm a senior design technologist at AWS and my background's in real-time 3D graphics and art direction for video games. Um, on Open3D Engine, I work a lot on content tools and workflows and have helped design some of the systems that you'll see today. So who are you? Well, hopefully you're intermediate skill level because I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things that are familiar to me. Um, hopefully they're familiar to you as well. If not, you can always Google them or come ask me for help after this presentation. Um, you might be a hobbyist, indie, or a AAA game developer, a level designer, environment artist, or someone who likes procedural design toolkits. On the bottom of this slide, I put a link to the GitHub repo for the, the demo that I'm gonna be showing you. You can go access that content and work with the project yourself. So today we're gonna to be talking about a lot of the touch points that would allow you to build a relatively simple scene like this, but something that looks good. We're gonna be talking about some lighting, environment lighting, procedural terrain and some vegetation systems. So what I'd like you to walk away with is that if you think about the way that you design your worlds, you can build modular content. You can build smaller reusable pieces like prefabs. So you could make a grasslands biome once but share it across multiple levels. So I want to promote the idea that you can work faster and that you can work bigger if you just think about the way that you design. And of course, again, we're gonna talk about landscapes, terrain, and biomes. And we're gonna go over some HDR environmental lighting and some post effects. And I wanna show you that even though it's early, Open3D Engine can make beautiful things today. So every world needs content. Today I'm gonna to be showing some 3D models, PBR materials and texture maps, some HDRI image-based lighting, source images, which we use for skybox and lighting in levels. I'm gonna be briefly covering digital content creation tools, but I don't have a lot of time, so I will only be showing a few. And to make this demo, I used image editors, material authoring tools like Substance, and train editors. Um, almost all of the content in this workshop was freely available. So I have some content links uh, resources here where you can go find that type of content. For instance, I pulled a bunch of um, CC0 or CC attribution models off of Sketchfab, and with the minimal amount of work, I was able to just bring them into this demo and use them. So to make a world like this, you're gonna have to use content creation tools. Um, everything that I made in this demo was made with a 3D tool, an image editor, the Substance tool suite, and a train editor called um, Quad Spinner Gaia. So there is um, a freely available alternative to pretty much every uh, content creation tool that I've used. The terrain one's a little bit harder to find, but you can actually sculpt height fields inside of Blender and some other tools. Some basic settings, when I work in Maya, I use a scene units of meters and a Z-up coordinate system because that best matches the engine. And my preferred export format is FBX because it works best with the Open3D engine um, asset processor. So getting started, basically want to launch the O3D project manager, create a project, and configure the gems. In this demo, I'm using the landscape canvas gem which enables the fast noise gem, the terrain gem, the vegetation gem, and then you'll wanna build your project, and once it's built, uh, launch the editor. And once you get into the editor, you're just gonna to wanna to make it a new level, which is very easy. I probably should have skipped this part, but. <laughs> so here we go, the default level looks like this, and we're gonna start modifying this level. So before we start modifying the level, let's talk about lighting. So, Realistic worlds need realistic lighting, and the easiest way to do that today is to use um, high dynamic range images. Here you'll see a lat long format source image. Lat long means a spherical pro projection un unwrapped. 
Uh, it's in an EXR image format, which allows it to be 32-bit high dynamic range information. And we're going to take an image like this, put it into Open3D Engine, and it outputs multiple cube maps. And these cube maps are appropriate for use in a skybox, specular reflections, and indirect diffuse, which you can also kind of think of as ambient light that's injected into the scene. At the bottom of this slide, I've provided um, some links where you can go download a whole bunch of free high dynamic range environments like this. Open3D Engine uses naming conventions to tell the asset processor what to do with source images and what kind of products you want to output. Here are three options for working with HDRI images. The one on the furthest right is the most common. It, your source image will output three different cube maps. But the default level actually uses a high contrast lighting environment. And what that means is that it has a bright, visible sun in the sky. So in this case, I've actually created a duplicate of the image and painted out the sun. And I've used two different configurations for naming conventions to generate the three cube map outputs that you see on the right. The skybox will have a visible sun that renders into the skybox. The other two cube maps you see here will be used for lighting. So basically, you drop your source asset in with the right naming convention, and then you'll, you'll want to find it and put the skybox into the skybox component. And then you'll want to put the specular QMAP output into the specular asset field of the skylight component. And then you'll want to do the same for the diffuse. And here I've showed what the diffuse would look like if you loaded it into the skybox itself. But it's basically injecting colored light into the scene. And then because we painted the sun out of the skybox and it's still rendered here, we want sun energy in our environment. So we've added a directional light. The directional light is aligned with the sun in the skybox. It adds the high dynamic range energy of the sun back into the scene, and it also provides the cascade shadows that are cast from objects. So let's customize a level. We're going to jump in and do some lighting, some materials, and post effects. So we're going to make a scene that basically looks like this. In this scene, we're going to have a PBR material applied to the ground. We're going to modify the skybox and global lighting. We're going to use the sky atmosphere and fog components. And we're going to replace the shader ball with a statue. A little bit about materials in Open3D Engine. We have a base metal rough shading model. And we have three types of materials that, that are based on that. Base PBR, which is pretty close to, I guess, the low end of GLTF shading. Standard PBR is pretty close to Disney 2012's um, BRDF and is compatible with applications like the principal BDRF inside of Blender or the standard surface in Maya. And then we have an enhanced PBR material that adds some additional features. The material editor looks like this. I'm not really going to dive deeply into this today. I'll show it once or twice. But it's very easy to create a new material. On the right, you'll see the property inspector. And for most materials, you're just loading your tex texture maps in. Here, I've shown a sandy material that we're going to be using on the ground. So the first things we'll want to do is go in and adjust the skybox, skylight, fog, and atmosphere. Then we're going to adjust the global lighting in the scene to match our changes, which includes duplicating and modifying the global skylight. And then we can create local reflection probes around the objects that we've placed in the scene. So let's go do this real quick. So let me get to the editor real quick. Sorry, I should have launched this ahead of time. So basically, let's go to Photoshop real quick. What I've done here is downloaded one of those HDRI images, and I've modified it. So I've, I've kind of painted a, a pseudo fake like ground plane in. And basically, because I want to be able to kind of control the type of light that is injected into the scene. And it's kind of hard to see that this is high dynamic range. But if we go look at an adjustment, we could play with the exposure here. If I can grab the actual, you can see that there's a lot of stops of imagery in here. And so I can 
really overexpose or underexpose this light and get a really high fidelity um, result. So this is the skybox and skylight that we're going to be placing into the scene. So, whoops, this is not the level I wanted to load. Sorry, my eyesight's terrible. Um, the one we want to load is called custom level start. For each one of these levels that I'm going to demo, I have a version called start and a version called final. So if, if you're following along at home or you want to follow along after this presentation, you could just open the one that's called dash final and you can pick those scenes apart and see how everything was put together. So let's open the scene. So here we have that default scene and we're just going to jump in here, in here and start making some changes. So I'm going to open up the outliner here and basically we can just select something like this ground plane and we're going to remove the material that's assigned to it and if we type dirt into this material asset field, you'll find a bunch of compatible materials. We're just going to click on the first one here and apply that dirt. I'm going to hide the grid because it's visually distracting. And then I want to show you that once you have a material assigned, if you open up this edit material instance, oh, that's weird. Sorry. Well, if you open up this edit material instance, let me clear these overrides. Let's see, this instance editor allows you to manipulate the assigned material while viewing it in the 3D viewport. And what I'm going to show here is we can just play with something like the scale of repeat on this material. I'm going to change it back to 0 0.25 because I think that looks pretty good. I often like to place human scale reference into my scene. So I'm going to make a mesh component. And I'm going to load a model that I call Mannequin. Sometimes I might refer to him as Manny. Uh, and I just kind of like drag him out here. And that's so I can see like the repeat of the material on the ground is um, at a frequency that kind of matches human scale. Let me get rid of some of this debug information. And then I'm going to grab the shader ball here. I'm just going to rename this entity Hermanubis. And I'm going to remove the shader ball and replace it with a Hermanubis model. And this was a model that I grabbed off public domain. And then I went into Substance Tool Suite and I generated UVs, retopologized it and then created some materials. So in the material component here, I'm just going to assign an existing material that I pre-made. Let's type in Hermanubis there again. And I'm going to grab this brass material. And maybe. For some reason, this is applying overrides. I'm going to remove those. OK. Maybe refresh. Well, that's weird. So that's, sorry, that's a bug. Let me disable this and re-enable it, see if it works. Uh, let me try a different model. Um, OK, well. We're going to pretend that brass material worked because it didn't. Oops. That's really weird. OK. Let me, I'll show you the final level when we're done so we can see what it looks like. The next thing we're going to do is modify the skybox. So. If I grab the skybox entity here, um, you'll see that I have two child entities underneath it. One is called original skybox, which is the one that's visible. And that's this skybox that we see here with the sun. And I'm just going to hide that. You'll see it disables the rendering of the skybox. And then I have this other child entity, and we can s swap this out. But basically, if I enable this component, 
we're going to load in that evening sun, and we want to pick the skybox asset, which is this first one here. And you can see it just replaces the skybox in the scene. And then the next thing we want to do is we can modify the lighting. So if I grab the sky atmosphere entity here, you'll see that um, there's a sky atmosphere component that's disabled. So let's add that. And if I turn the camera around, you can see that if I enable and disable this component, that it adds a sun in the sky and some atmosphere around the horizon. And so I'm going to turn on helpers so that we can see some additional information. So here we have our directional sunlight, which is another child entity here. And I'm going to select that. And you'll see that if I rotate this entity, well, we can move the sun in the sky. But it's not updating for some reason. So let me open up the next level. So when that's done being tuned, that level would look like this. So we, we have a pretty nice sky, ground, and we've added uh, additionally a fog component, which if I look at the color swatch on this, you can see I can tune the color of the fog in the background. I've already pre-tuned this to work with our ground material, and this kind of helps this material kind of fade off in the di distance, which looks nicer. And then the other thing that we've basically done is if I open up this cube map hierarchy, under here I have three cube map entities. One has a diffuse IBL cube map capture. One has a global specular IBL cube map capture. And I have one that has a reflection probe on it. Let me turn on helpers so we can see that. So this reflection probe has a box which defines the capture area for the reflections. The yellow box is defining where the reflection probes are active. The blue box in the middle describes how that reflection blends with other reflection probes or with the global reflections. So let me turn helpers back off. And then what we can see here is if I select the statue and hide him, and we grab the local reflection probe component, I can turn on visualization. And we can see that, other than the fog, we can see that what we've done is we've made changes to the skybox, and we've made changes to the ground plane. And what we've done is we captured those changes inside of this reflection probe. And so that information is going to be reflected um, into the, the statue model itself. And it's pretty subtle, but if I disable this component, you can see that there's a change. So what you're seeing right now is reflections that don't include the, the dirt ground plane. And then we've corrected the lighting by using those cube map capture components and loading that information back into the skylight. So that's the basics of um, customizing a, the default level to get started. So let's go back to the slide deck. And now we're going to do some um, post effects. So post effects is a term that comes from VFX and CGI, which is when you would take um, shot or footage from a movie. And in post production, you'd take it into a studio and you would do things like color grading and video editing. So we're going to do a little bit of that and make a default look. So we're basically going to go from this look that we just made. And we're going to make something that looks a little more cinematic, kind of like I expect Tatooine to look like in Star Wars or something. So to do that, it's really easy. We're just going to select the camera, add a post effect layer component, and then add a number of different post effect components. Each adds a different effect. So let's go do that real quick. So I have another level here I'm going to load that's called post effect start. And I've partially pre-baked this scene. I'm going to grab this camera entity. I have all the post-effect components added on this entity. 
um, what's important is that you need to add this post effect layer component and then all of these others can be added. So I'm gonna start enabling some of them. The first one we have is Bloom, which you can see, it's gonna isolate the highlights on your objects and bloom them. This is consider, considered a lensing effect. It happens because of the properties of light coming through the optics of the camera. This next one is screen space ambient occlusion, which in this level is pretty subtle, but you can see it creates a darkening where two surfaces meet like the statue hitting the ground plane. The next component is exposure. So this one was already enabled, but I'm gonna show you, you can enable it and disable it. So we have some really bright high dynamic range lighting in here and enabling this allows us to correct it. It defaults to a manual only, which means that I can play with exposure manually, but I'm gonna set this to one and if you switch it from manual only to eye adaptation, then you'll see that the exposure is dynamic and adapts to what's being viewed. So if I go look at the sun, you'll see it starts darkening and it will lighten back up when I look at my subject matter. This one is depth of field, which is another lensing effect that puts things in or out of focus based on where you're viewing. So you'll see that part of the statue's out of focus, and then if I come back, pull the camera in, it refocuses on that. It's basically like autofocus on your smartphone or DSLR camera. And then we have another interesting component called HDR color grading. I'm gonna turn this on. This is basically Instagram for Open3D Engine. We have a number of different color grading effects that can be applied here from a simple kind of color filter, which would be like putting a gel in front of your, in front of your camera um, white balance, which is very common in Photoshop and is too subtle to actually see here, but it corrects shadows and highlights. Um, you'd usually apply something like that to a raw image that you'd catch on a DSLR. Split toning allows us to isolate the highlights or shadows and kind of tint them. So this one, you can see, is pretty subtle, but we start getting a more kind of cinematic. You can see the shadows down in the sand are starting to tint towards blue. And the shadow midtones is a similar type of filter, only you can express color changes over um, three bands, and a, you can adjust those bands, so there's a little more control here, and that allows us to filter this a little bit further. And then we have some additional controls we can run after color grading, like saturation. And so these can all be tuned to get a default look and a level. This system, and a also allows us to blend looks, and I'm not gonna have time to go into that today, but effectively I could have a desert look and like a tundra look in the Arctic, and as I move through the world, I would be able to blend between those two looks. And that's it for post effects, pretty straightforward. Any questions? No questions, do you have a question? Oh, I thought Darren did. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go back to the slide deck. The next part of this demo, we're gonna start getting procedural. So this demo is gonna be called Building Blocks, and we're gonna cover the course concepts behind procedural level design. So procedural modeling is basically an umbrella term in computer graphics. Um, it can describe L systems, which we would use to make procedural vegetation like a tree with branches. It can be fractals like Mandelbrot. Um, we're using it to describe the procedures of rules applied to data being input to the scene and using that data to express how those rules um, generate things within a level. So we're, we're doing generative procedural modeling. And what we're gonna do is create a simple world like this block world, which kind of like Minecraft. But I want to show you, with, you can use the fewest number of parts to build something that is interesting. And basically, to get started with this, we're going to need multiple blocks of varied color. So in the assets, I have a block FBX asset. I've added a material component to each of those. I created six different tinted materials. I applied it to five copies of the blocks and saved each one as a prefab. 
there's a level inside of the demo that's called prefab zoo where you can see how those individual prefabs will be set up but these are basically the objects that we'll be placing and um, let me talk about the systems that are being used so we're gonna abuse the system that we call dynamic vegetation um, dynamic vegetation is basically a decorative object placement placement system we mostly use it to place vegetation on surfaces like the terrain or models. That system utilizes another system that's called gradient signals. And we call it this because a gradient, of course, is a representation of black to white or zero to one. And inside of the gradient signal system, we have nodes that can create things like procedural noise. So that might be Perlin noise or a cellular noise. Another type of gradient signal could be bringing in external data like an image. The next system that's going to be in play is called surface data. And the way that I would describe surface data is that it's semantic world design. What it allows me to do is tag a surface and express something like an inf information like I could select the terrain and add a tag that says I am terrain. I could add an image use it as a mask with a tag that says, I am grasslands or I am forest. So effectively, what we want to do is, instead of placing every single tree or every rock or piece of vegetation or even painting them with a scatter brush, we basically want to say, hey, I can describe in the world where everything should exist. And then all I have to do is activate the system that plants grass, and it will only plant where I have told it to. The next piece is Landscape Canvas, which is like Script Canvas. It's a, it's a node-based graph tool. I'd call it a world graph. But it allows us to do things like signal composition, so I can mix procedural noise with image-based noise. Or I could create a node that can isolate slope from the terrain or work on things like altitude. So I can do all this signal composition and then pass that data into rules that are expressed in the world. And then again, I covered decorative object placement system. But basically, landscape canvas and dynamic vegetation spawn prefabs. So you'll want to add the vegetation system component to your world. And the way you do that is you select the root level entity. You add that component. And for this demo, the settings that were going to be placed are in this slide. But the important ones are that the sector size in meters is 10. So I'm going to be placing in my camera view multiple sectors on X and Y in world space. Each sector is 10 by 10 meters. And the sector point density is 10. So I'm going to be placing one block every meter within every sector. And then for this demo, I set the sector point snap mode to center so that the placement of the block is at the center of the block, not at the corner of the block. And then most importantly, if you try this at home, Initially, you'll think it may not work, and that's because by default, the dynamic vegetation system is configured to plant on terrain. So what you'll want to do is grab the ground entity in your level and add a mesh surface tag emitter, hit the plus button, and set that pull down to terrain, which will make that mesh um, basically mimic the terrain system itself. And then if you want to access the landscape canvas tool, which is actually optional, then you'll just want to create an entity and add the landscape canvas component. And when you hit the edit button, it will open a graph tool that looks like this. So as you can see in this graph tool, on the right, we have a green node. That's my vegetation system. It has multiple extenders. Those extenders are rules. Here, I've shown a position extender modifier, which will change the position of block placement based on a signal and a rotation, which will you know, give it a rotation. And on the left, um, I have a fast noise component, which is the red block. It's generating procedural noise, and it's passing through a purple block, which is a modifier. So we're modifying that signal mathematically. In this case, it's posterizing that effect into, e like I think, six bands of equal value. And then at the bottom, we have um, a random noise generator. And we're using that for like random selection of objects or random jitter on rotation. So let's jump in and build this level. OK, so I'm going to open up building blocks start. 
And here we kind of have this basic level that's similar to what we had before, but I've, I've placed a green ground plane on here. You can see that um, I have a global cube map that's reflecting, and I can actually grab that and disable it. If we grab this, we can disable the visualization. And then if I grab my level entity at the root, you can see I've added a vegetation system component with the settings that were in that previous slide. So that system's active. And if I turn on helpers, what you'll see here is a couple boxes. They're these big yellow squares. Let me go down inside of the box so we can see better. But um, this is hard to see in here. But basically, it's hard to see here, but there's some wireframes. But I basically, let me select that box. If we select this entity called World Box, you'll see that I've made a 128 meter by 128 meter box that's 16 meters high, and I've placed that in the world. So I called it World Box because that's going to define the area that we are going to place things within. Um, I've created an entity that has the landscape canvas component on it so we can launch the graph editor. And I have the beginnings of a block layer. So what's important here is I've added the vegetation layer spawner. That requires us to add a vegetation asset list component. And that allows us to select and describe what objects that we want to place. And that requires a, sh a shape. In this case, I use the shape reference. And I'm just referencing the world block. So this layer is going to be placing things inside of the world box. So I'm going to turn off helpers now. And we're just going to make this like. So if I add an object whoops, to our vegetation asset list, um, it spawns prefab. So I'm just going to go into this asset list and type block. And I'm going to add my first block. And what you'll see is we're starting to plant some purple blocks. And it, you can see it starts planting near the camera and, and all the way out until it fills up the edges of that world box. And this is not super interesting. And that's OK, because we're going to make it cool. Um, but basically, proceduralism is pretty bland and can be repetitive. So we want ways to art direct and describe how systems can be expressive. So let's open up Landscape Canvas here real quick. So what we have here is um, a very basic system where we have a box and a thing that places within the box. But let me double click this. Over here on the left, we have all of our different nodes. I'm just going to grab a fast noise component. And I'm going to drag it into the scene. And you'll see here that this is a procedural noise generator. Um, I'm going to take this shape reference. And I'm going to plug it into the world box. You can also do that with wires. So I'm going to visually wire up. So I'm passing the world box into this box. Procedural noise owns this box. You'll see it change the frequency of the noise. And what I can do is. I have a gradient transform modifier that lets me mathematically alter how that system's described. So we can use this kind of like a, a microscope. or, And I'm going to zoom in. And then we have a whole bunch of different types of noise that can be generated by this system. And some interesting ones might be like cellular noise, which is a Veroni pattern. Um, I'm going to just leave it on Perlin fractal. So all we need to do now to start changing our system is add some rules. So I'm going to add the extender for the position modifier, which is going to take a second, probably because it's replanting the world. But you'll see it, it adds, whoops, give it a sec. It adds this block to the end of our vegetation layer. And you'll see it has an x, y, and z input wire. We can see here it has more parameters. But basically, I'm going to take this Perlin noise signal. And I'm going to wire it into the z component for the blocks. And then 
let me minimize this for a sec, you'll see that it didn't change anything. And that is because by default, the min and max range for modifying the Z placement of a block are both set to zero. But if I change this to something like, let's try five, and then minimize this, you can see it's gonna replant the world and each block is gonna get a shift in height and that shift is coming from the noise information that we fed into that particular rule. So what we really wanna do is spawn blocks that are each an raised an equal height of one meter for each step. So we can do that by going back to, whoops, to our graph editor and we can place a posterization node into here and we can pass this signal in there. Actually, I'm gonna make this a little easier. I'm gonna add a, a reference shape to this entity so that I can plug the world box into it. Um, and the reason I did that is because I want to be able to define where in the world I'm sampling data and previewing it within this image here. So what you can see here is that we've taken that inbound signal and isolated it into three bands. So there's multiple types of posterization that can occur. Um, these are mathematical operations on the inbound signal. PS stands for Photoshop, so this one, mimics the way Photoshop works, was I, I always get a bottom band that's black and a top band that's white. So I'm gonna leave that here and we can go look at the world. Oh, I forgot to wire it up, sorry. We wanna replace our fast noise signal with our posterization signal. And if we go back, we'll see the world's gonna be replanted. And we get these high and low areas if I put the correct number of bands into here, which I think is five, then I should see no gaps and I sh should get six steps. Oh, it might be six. Yeah, okay, so now we have blocks that are being placed at different heights, but we wanna make it more visually interesting so we can place blocks of different color. So if I grab my block layer, we can go and we can add, I'm actually gonna briefly disable the block layer so that I can work on the component um, without it replanting each time I modify a parameter. So we're gonna hit the plus button on the vegetation asset list a few more times and we are going to load all of our blocks. So they're named block 01, block 02. So they should be pretty easy to add here. And block five. And then block six. All right, so now I'm gonna re-enable um, the planting layer, and it's only per planting purple blocks. And that's because we haven't described to the system how to make um, selection of assets. So let's go back to our landscape canvas and do that real quick. So we can just add a new extender here. And for this one, I'm gonna select a vegetation asset weight selector. So what this does is, pretty much what it describes. I can bring a weighted signal in and use that signal to describe how to select from that list of six blocks. And in this case, all I really have to do is pass this posterization signal in to that rule. And now that rule is operating on the same data as block height. So now I can place steps of different colored information and now, now we have a complete system. Um, where we could go further with this is 
I've, I've actually added collision to these blocks, but you, you could make a playable level where you can run around on the blocks. Because it's spawning prefabs, each block could be turned into a destructible. So I, I, could, um, I could add the blast gem and make them destructible. Um, you could have blocks have script canvas information on them, so maybe they spawn chests or trees or something else on, on top. So you could use this as the basis for a, a fully generative world. And if I select our fast noise component, I, you can actually just see that I can just generate a new random seed and just replant the whole level. And so let me open up that final one because it's tuned up a little bit better where you can see all of the block heights. But if I took that world box that's 128 meters by 128 meters, I could expand it arbitrarily large, I think all the way up to at least 32 meters, maybe 64 before you start hitting preci precision issues. Um, let's see what's going on here. This isn't placing anything. Oh, it's disabled. Oh no, I must have written over that level. It's in the repo though, so I'll fix it later. Let's jump on and jump ahead. Let's see, back to the slide deck. Any questions? Yes. Yes. So I'm going to show you some other parts of the demo where we start expanding the concepts I just showed you to do things like generate terrain. But there happens to be a set of components. Let me describe one. So there's, there's a shape, height, surface provider. So I could take something like a sphere or a box, and I can sample it as height data. And then I could move that sphere box around in the world, um, and I could see that expressed basically as a gradient signal, and then I could sample it as height. There's a similar system where I can create a falloff component, and I can take and make a fuzzy edge from the outer edge of a sphere and make a fuzzy object that can move around the terrain, and I could use that in mask sampling. So I could, for instance, I could use it to represent a field of purple flowers, and when I move that sphere around the terrain, the purple flowers will be planted within that area. Um, and similarly, I believe that there is a way to sample height directly from meshes. There's definitely a way to plant on meshes. You can make any mesh a surface for planting. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, good. OK. So, Let's move on. So we're going to do some terrain basics now. And I want to show you that it's really simple to take the same things that we just did with a block level and go from flat terrain to something bumpy. <laughs> Ken knows how easy it is. OK, so I'm going to open a level called terrain basic start. And this is going to look like our where we left off on post effects. It's going to take a second to load. All right, so the first thing we need to do is select the, the root level entity, but instead of adding a vegetation system component, we're going to add these two terrain system components. One's called terrain world, and this describes like the minimum and maximum height in the world that I want to create terrain. And that's because gradient signals are zero, zero to one values. And so I want to kind of set what one means up here. Um, and then we have a train world renderer, which activates the rendering of the train mesh. And then I have pretty much left these all at default values with the exception of these two right here, the height query resolution and the surface data query resolution I've set to 0 0.25, which means I'm gonna sample a point every quarter of a meter. Um, let's go ahead and look at how 
we've set up the landscape canvas here. So we have an entity with the landscape canvas component so we can open the graph editor. I've got a train world box. Let me turn on helpers. When I look out here, we see two sets of wireframes. There's the big yellow wireframe, which is our which is a box that matches our terrain. So it's 128 meters by 128 meters by 64 meters tall. And then I have a base terrain layer entity. That's the name of it. It doesn't have to be named that. And on this, um, I've created, it, this has the, the basic components for activating physics on the terrain, um, which I'm not gonna show. And, but basically all I'm gonna do is select this entity and add the terrain height gradient list, which is gonna require a terrain layer spawner component. And it's, this is pretty similar to like selecting things I wanna place with dynamic vegetation, but it's selecting things that I want to represent the terrain height field. Now, what's important is that this entity has an axis aligned box shape, which is this kind of pancake box wireframe we can see. It's only four meters tall. And what I'm saying is this particular terrain layer is actually only going to place within the minimum and maximum bounds of this box, which is four meters high. So let's open up landscape canvas because I want to show you that it basically looks very similar whoops, to our last graph. Let me rearrange some of this real quick. But instead of a green node, we have a brown node for terrain. And all I'm gonna do is wire this up. And then I'm gonna go back and you're gonna see bumpy terrain. It's that simple. So instead of placing blocks at various heights, we've created sample points to create bumpy terrain. And let me grab, let me turn off helpers and we'll grab the statue and the mannequin and kind of raise them up. Hold on a sec. Okay. No, he's not moving. Oh, he's gonna be buried in train. It's okay, he's been there for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, it, this one should move. I don't know why it's not updating. Maybe they're in a different group. Well, I can open up the other level and show you in a minute, but basically let, let's move on. So all we really need to do next is we just want to texture the train. So because it's not a mesh, we're not going to use the material component. What we're going to use is a train, uh, train surface materials list component. And this allows us to start assigning detailed terrain materials. So if I just type my dirt on sandy ground in here, I can apply that material to the terrain. Um, once I start making changes like this to a level, again, it's important to reiterate that you'll wanna go correct your global lighting and reflections to mimic those changes. So you can go back to your cube map component, cube map capture components, and you can recapture the global specular, the global diffuse, and like a large reflection box around your world, and they will, they will take into account the changes that you've made into your terrain. But I'm not gonna do that on, on every level here, but I have done it on all of the example levels inside of the repository. So let's open up what the final level looked like. Oh, that's, sorry, I opened the wrong one because my eyesight's terrible. Train basics final. Okay. And there, here you go. So we've, we've moved the human scale reference in the statue. Um, 
So I think this looks pretty good. Let's move on to the next topic. Whoops. Which, okay, this one. So the next thing, oh, I've already covered this. We, we set up a world box landscape canvas, a fast noise component. We fed it into the train layers, height filled, and we assigned a material. So let's jump ahead. We're gonna talk about macro color. So this is where we start talking about the concept of external data. So we're basically gonna go from this sort of sandy look to something that's a little bit more like the Sahara Desert. And basically we can take the in-system height field, which was our fast noise, and we can attach it to a component that's called a gradient baker, and we can write, sample and write that information out to an image on disk. Then we can take that height map or other baked information into train, train and other digital content creation tools. For this demo, I've used Quad Spinner Gaia, um, which is one of my favorite train tools. And then we're gonna modify that information in the DCC tool to generate new outputs. In this case, I'm generating a macro color map and a macro normal map. And later on in this demo, you can also create and utilize splat maps. And a splat map is an image that would describe where to place something. So it, it could be where I want to place vegetation. It could be where I want to place a specific type of terrain detail material like dirt. So let's go do this real quick. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the next level, which is called Terrain Basics Macro Materials Start. Any questions before I move on? All right, let's just jump in. Okay, so we're gonna go back down into our entity hierarchy here, and we've got our lands landscape canvas entity. I'm gonna open up this graph. This graph is a little bit messy. This system is actively in development. So having better graph layouts will improve over time. But basically what we have here is our fast noise being fed into terrain and you know our, our shape information for bounds. All I need to do here is grab a gradient baker and drag it out here. I'm gonna wire our fast noise to that. So that's what I wanna sample on disk. Again, I'm gonna add a reference shape so that I can more easily fix the preview. I'm gonna wire that up to the terrain box, if it works. Sorry. It's not working. So I'm just gonna use this wire and hope that this part works. So it, we can also wire up bounds with these blue wires. Okay, so that worked. So now we're previewing the inbound signal and this is what the signal that's gonna be written out to disk will look like. So here all we have to do is set an output path and I'm just gonna save it into the same level that we're working on. So I've, I've got one here. I'm just gonna call this like O2 and hit save. And then all you have to do is hit this bake image button and then we can go to Photoshop and you can see that image is written out on disk inside of our level folder. And so there we go, we have the same data externally. Um, what I've done is gone into a train editor called Gaia, and what you can see here is this entry file node here is just loading that same height field data, but expressing it as height. So this more or less should match the height that we see inside of Open3D Engine. And then the rest of this graph um, just describes some very simple processing to create some masks and combine them in an interesting way to make color maps. And I'm gonna export a normal map. And 
It takes a second to bake, so I've already done that. And all we need to do is go back into O3D. For this one, I don't even need landscape canvas. I'm just gonna minimize that. And what we can do is grab our terrain component. So this entity is called base terrain layer. And we add a component called a terrain macro material. And here we can just go select the images that we made in our terrain tool. So let me go in there. It's in the levels folder. Oops. Let's see, we can just use this set right here. No, that's a different one. This one. So we're gonna load that color map and you see that it was applied to the terrain. I can remove it so we can see the difference. But basically, you can see here that the, the signals varied. So we have kind of more reddish sand on the peaks and we have darker, dirtier sand in the crevices, which adds some subtle detail to the world. And then if I add the no normal map, we'll see that it, in, it enhances the lighting a little bit. So there it is without, and then we've re-added. So the normal map perturbs the surface value and, and to decide where to pick up the light from, from the global skylight and also from the directional light, the sun. And so that's, that's the basics of, that's the least amount of work that I have to do to bring in some interesting data to augment the way my world looks. So let's go back to the slide deck. Any questions? Yes. So if I want to edit my splat map, do I have to go through the external tool or I can edit that directly with the input? Well, you can do either, both, or combine them. Um, later in the demo, I'll show you a splat map that I created by creating a tube shape to make a road and then a cylinder shape to make a clearing. And then I used a fall off node to make those edges fuzzy, and then I baked it out to an image, which I can show you. And I even brought that into the terrain editor to use as a mask for making an area dirtier, right? So it's the whole system's designed to be able to mix, mix and match internal in-system and external data um, pretty fluidly. Any other questions before I move on? All right, I am questioning my sanity. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So now let's talk about detail blending. So this is a pretty simple concept as well, but basically I want to go from one material, which is sand, to blending multiple materials. Here are isolated uh, kind of rocky dirt, and I'm blending those two together in world space. Um, again, I want to show you the fewest number of steps and least amount of work to just make a change like this. So let's close this down. I'm gonna open the next level, which is called Terrain Blending Start. And it's gonna pretty much look similar to this. Okay, so let's take the next step. Um, if I open up Landscape Canvas for this world, I've made, I've made some additional modifications. Sorry, I need to drag this graph around a little bit real quick. Um, okay, so I'll describe what you're seeing here in a second. Okay. All right, so, whoops, I just wanna grab this one. So what I've done is I've gone into my train editor and I have a different level called terrain blend with a more complex graph. But the important thing is here is it's generating this particular mask, which I'm writing out to disk as well as the normal map and the color map. So 
this image that was created on disk is being loaded into a new image component you can see here, which is, again, previewing inside of our train world box. But this map was baked from curvature information of the train. So the white areas, again, represent those like peaks, and the darker areas represent the, the divots in the terrain. And I want to use this information to augment our scene. And so in this case, I've taken our original fast noise, and I've taken this image gradient, and I've put them into a node called a gradient mixer. Now, the gradient mixer is pretty much exactly like a Photoshop layer stack. I have two layers coming in. I have a, my fast noise layer, and I have a second layer that's bringing in my image input. And here we can change the operations. So these are all very Photoshop-like. And you can see the image preview on this mixed, this levels gradient actually is probably the one that's easiest to see. But if I play with the opacity, of that second layer, I, I can show you how those two images are being blended together. And in, in this case, I'm going to put it back, uh, I think on Lighten. And so I'm basically going to bring in a little bit of our world information along with our fast noise. And I've passed it into a levels gradient. And this levels gradient. Um, let me show you. So this levels gradient allows me to have controls to augment the signal mathematically so I can, for instance, in this case, I'm going to isolate the highlights more. And then th that image we're going to use. So let's go out of Landscape Canvas and select our base terrain layer. And to do this, what we're going to want to add is... Um, a terrain uh, surface gradient list. And we're going to hit this plus button on it. Now, I'm going to take this blend mask, which is what we named that leveling component. So this was the final node in the graph. And I'm going to pass that in to I'm going to use this gradient reference on this layer here, and I'm going to pick that node. So you're going to see it sampled here. But what this allows me to do is assign a tag. So I'm going to pick a tag called Sandy Peaks. So now every point on the terrain is emitting a tag, a weighted tag, where if the signal is a thresholded value near white, then that point on the terrain is emitting a signal called Sandy Peaks. And we're going to use that as a masking operation to blend two materials. So if I go back to my terrain surface materials list, in this case, what I'm going to do is clear that original material. And I'm going to use a, um, one called Rocks and Clay. Actually, I'm going to use rocks and clay underscore HP underscore T, which stands for high pass terrain. And I can show you in Photoshop what, what we're doing here. So I'm placing this rocky material every, everywhere now. And this is a good point for me to step back for one sec. Actually, let's just finish this blending operation. And then I'll go describe what's going on with these materials. So I want to add the plus button and add a second material. So we can pick our dirt on sandy ground. That was our original. You see it didn't change anything by adding it because we, want, we need to describe where to place it. So here, I want to pick a surface tag. I'm going to pick sandy peaks. And what that basically did was it allowed that surface mask that they were emitting to now be used as the mask for the blending operation. And you can see here that those two materials are, are blending together. So we have that rocky material kind of in the, the lower divots. And what we can do, there's a couple ways to control blending. One is that we can go back to 
our mixer node and we could start playing with, with the information here. So you can see I can start making changes that will impact the, the downstream um, blending operations. Or I could go back to our blend mask, which was the levels component, and I could start making changes to that signal, which would allow me to start increasing the amount of surface that's going to receive that rocky material and isolating the areas that are on the sandy peaks. So the way these terrain detail materials work is that they can also blend in a height biased way. So the height map of each material describes how they meet, and then I have some controls that allow me to um, do the fine-tuned blending, which probably isn't going to show up very well, well um, in this sort of demo, but I could show someone in person or um, make a video on it later. But basically, if, if I go into Photoshop, I can open up those, one of those materials. Let's open up the, um, the dirt on sandy ground. So here I've got base color. I'm going to open up this high pass base color, and we have this height map. So we're feeding a height map in, and what, what, what's happening with this height map is that I'm describing a bumpy surface, and then the rocks have a bumpy surface, and those two meet. And so I can impact the blending information be where the, the height information begins to ex exchange data during blending. And then the way that the detailed terrain materials blend with the macro color is that my dirt albedo map originally looked like this. But then I created a high pass version of it. And this is the actual texture map that I'm loading into the detail material that's being applied to the terrain. But as you can see, with both the sand and the rocks, I have some color information coming through. So I'm going to show you that in a sec. But basically, the quick, the quick way to do this is to just go into Photoshop and run a high pass filter. And you'll see here that it retains some color information. Um, but it removes, uh, so it's basically separating the high frequency details from the low frequency. There's a more advanced version of this where you can isolate the low frequency data and use it separately, but I'm not going to have time to cover that in today's presentation. But that's the gist of it. And so if I go back to the engine, I'm going to open the material editor real quick. Um, this one. Take a sec to load. OK, so let's open up one of these materials. Let's go to the, the rocks and clay. So here I have the original high pass material. Let's go beveled cube. So you can see here that I've got brown dirt. Um, I have a sibling material that's a high pass material. And what you can see here is if, if I take this color swatch here and I make it white, you can see that there's not a lot of color in here. So what's happening is I'm taking a color value and I'm mixing it back in with the high pass texture map to define an output. So you can see here if I get the brown color closer to what the original texture was that I, you know, if I tuned this or if I knew the specific value to plug in, I could make it look almost identical to this original one. And then I have a third material here, which is the same material, but it's the version that we've applied to terrain. And what's happening is the macro color of the terrain is replacing the information that you would otherwise have in this color swatch. So this color swatch just becomes 
um, is here for the intent of preview while you're authoring the materials before they're applied to the train. And then we have a section down here called terrain. This is a terrain detail material type, and it overrides the height values for standard PBR that would normally be used for parallax occlusion and height displacement, and it extends them with additional controls. These are the controls that allow me to control and the influence of how two materials blend together when their edges meet. And I can edit these real quick, but the effects are, are fairly subtle in some cases. So the first thing I'm just gonna do is change this height offset to zero, and I'm gonna change this height scale to like 0 0.5, and then save that. And you'll see it, it does update the blending. So one of the materials started taking over a little bit more area, and so I can use those controls to shift um, which material has a higher precedence. Um, so again, if I put this value as high as it will go, and I offset this one, I can give the rock away higher priority, so it starts shifting up the edges of the terrain. So that's that's pretty much it for for blending. Um, now I want to talk about procedural vegetation biomes real quick. So let's go back to our slide deck. And before I move on, any questions? No? Okay. So we did this live demo. We created a, a, ra a rock, rocky material, assigned it, we made a mask, we extended the train surface materials list, um, and then we tweaked the biased, height bias blending between two materials. So here, we're gonna move on to procedural biomes. So we're gonna use the same concepts that we used in building blocks, but instead of placing blocks, we're gonna plant some um, objects on the ground, like grass. And if you follow this at home, you can make something that basically looks like this. So here we have a layer of rocks, a layer of grass, and a layer of succulent cacti. And like the block level, the first thing I did was create an environment art prefab zoo, and I went, loaded all of these objects in, put their material component on, assigned their materials, and saved those, those all as prefabs. And that was, that was the iteration cycle where I was also adjusting things like the look of the materials themselves. So like the succulents are glossier than the grass or the rocks, and the rocks, I modified their albedo so that they would more closely match the hues that are in the terrain. So. Like I said, each, each object is basically an entity with a mesh component, a material component, and then you just right click and say create prefab. So here's what the rock layer looks like in isolation. And here's what the succulents look like in isolation. And here's what the grass looks like in isolation. And then we'll get to applying them all together and to that final environment. So, Let's go back to the editor. I have a layer here called, um, let's see, start biome layer. And what I want to show you is I can design a biome in a small confined space, right? And then later I can spread that out over like a very large world. So this world is actually a 32 by 32 meter piece of terrain, and I don't have any blending going on, it's just flat. Um, and I'm just gonna use this as a blank canvas to make a vegetation system on. So all we need to do really is, um, I'm gonna grab my terrain world box and I'm gonna create a new entity, and I'm just gonna call this grass layer, and then we're going to add the vegetation layer spawner, and then that's going to require us to use a, a box, which is the placement area, so I'm going to use a shape reference again, and I'm just going to reference our, um, our world box, which 
if you turn on helpers, you can see is this wireframe box on the edges here. And then it wants the vegetation asset list. So just like with the blocks, it wants a set of things to place. So here I'm just going to add some grass. So I'm just going to select my first grass patch, and you're going to see it's going to start planting those things. Oops, and the frame rate needs to catch up. So here everything is pretty boring and very regular because it's planting one thing on each um, sampled grid point. So we can quickly make this look more organic by just adding a few rules. So let's open up Landscape Canvas real quick. OK, so here's our vegetation layer spawner. So the, the first thing I'm going to do is have a gradient layer. Um, just going to pull random noise out. And on our vegetation layer, I'm going to add a scale modifier. And I'm going to take this random noise, and I'm going to wire it into that rule. And then I'm going to minimize landscape canvas real quick. And you'll see nothing changed. We just need to select our vegetation layer, which we called grass layer. Um, if we go down to the scale modifier, we can see that the min and max range by default is set to 1, so everything's the same size. But if I start changing this a little, like maybe 0 0.75 to maybe 1.5, you can see that it's going to start changing the scale of each object, which begins to obfuscate the regular expression of this system. And then we're going to go a little bit further. If we, add the, if we add the rotation modifier, we can add a rotation rule. I'm going to name this last entity we put in here uh, random noise. Give me a sec. So we can remember what it was. So if I grab my grass layer, we go down. We're going to take this vegetation rotation modifier. We're going to rotate around the z-axis. By default, that is already set up for minus 180 to 180 rotations. And we can just take this gradient reference and feed it that random noise. And we're going to get a random sampling between 0 and 1, which is going to apply a rotation somewhere between minus 180 and 180. So you can see, again, that that further obfuscates the regular pattern. And then the last thing that we want to do, not the last thing, the second to last thing, is add a position modifier. And just like with the blocks, we're going to change the way that things are planted. Here, on this position modifier, we're not going to change the z component. We're going to change the x and y. So. Um, I need to open up these gradient fields. OK, so I'm going to take this x gradient modifier, and I'm just going to pick the random noise. So everything's getting shifted on x some random amount between a minus 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. So they're all shifting a little bit away from their center. And I can do the same for y. but Mathematically, what happens if I use the same value on two separate axes, I just get a diagonal shift. Um, so there's ways you could further obfuscate that. You could create a second random noise generator with a different seed so that the y gets a completely different offset. The other thing you could do is you could go in here on one of these fields and play with these additional values. So here there's an advanced um, and invert input. So I'm, I'm just going to in invert, so now black is 1 and white is 0. Um, and then there's some additional controls you could take in here. Um, hold on a sec. This one's called Enable Transform. I could enable that. And I could just play a, put a mathematical rotation on the sampling. So here I could do something like 45. So with all of these like nuances, I can get a lot of random expression in, in the system. 
And the last thing that we would do is just plant three different types of grass. So let me add our second grass and our third grass. And then we just need to add that um, asset weight selector. And in this case, we're just going to say, I randomly want to pick from one of these three. So this weight selector can just operate on random noise. <coughs> Pardon me. It's a really long demo. <laughs> um, from here, you could just take this grass layer, right click on it and create a prefab. Um, here, we want to move everything inside of it. And I could just save this somewhere. So just say, OK, that's where it is. Now I could take that prefab of this grass system. I could just drag it into any level. So um, I'm not going to build all the three layers. I'm just going to show you real quick the, um, the rock biome. The only real difference in this biome is that there are 17 different rocks. So it's just getting a, a random select. Oh, no. The dreaded GPU default. Well, I'm going to have to restart the editor. But basically, um, I get a random selection of 17 different rocks. And then I've created a succulent layer. When I boot up the editor, I'll load that. And what that does is it, for one of the asset types, it adds um, an asset selection that's called empty. And that allows me to not place something in a cell. And then I can apply a weight to that so I can set it to like 30. So that means from my list of objects, one in 34 objects is going to be an empty cell. Let me restart the editor real quick. And then that empty cell, I have two different rules for it. I can say, I'm empty, but I'm claimed. So the next system that wants to come plant things cannot plant in that position. And then there's a flag where I can set it that says, um, dis disallow empty sectors from being claimed, which means the next system that comes around along like rocks can place a rock in that empty hole. So I'm going to show you those systems here real quick. Any questions while this is booting up? Yes, John. How easy is it if you want to make a manual change, how do you procedurally integrate it between uh, to remove meshes or There are components like, there's a component called a blocker. So if I have like the statue or an object and I don't want grass or things to be planted underneath it, I can attach a blocker component to that mesh. And then anything that tries to plant or claim in that position will get rejected. So that's one method. Another method is called a distribution filter. So I can take a weighted gradient signal. I could, for instance, pass it through a dithered um, modifier. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. Pardon me. Um, I could dither a signal. And then I could use that as a distribution filter and be like, I have positive and negative space described by an image or a signal, and I'm only going to plant grass in the white areas. right? So I could make a, a patch that represents a field of grass. Um, and I, I can show you that in this demo real quick. As far as placing individuals, um, that becomes a little more limited. Uh, you, you can hand place any amount of objects that you want, but if you want that spot to then also be claimed so something else doesn't plant on top of it, you'd need to use the blocker um, or one of those other mechanisms. And that's where things do start becoming a little bit more complex at scale. Because you do need to think about, like, oh, I want to make the witch's hut. And the witch's hut has its own mask that describes, you know, I'm going to place thorns around the witch's hut. And then I could just drop that anywhere in the world in the middle of a swamp. And I get a witch's hut with thorns around it, but I've removed all of the trees in that area of the swamp. right? So we have all of the rules that allow you to do those sort of things, which if we, if we open up this last level here, um, good, I can show you some of those things. 
So this one's called, oh, no, that's not the right one, again. Um, let's see, it's called Terrain Biomes. I'm just gonna open this up. And, and this, this is my, the final level that we are trying to work towards. I, I'll just so, show you some features in here. But, but basically, you see that these layers are being planted everywhere, and this is a much larger patch of world than the 32 meters that we authored them in. And, and that basically what I did was, let me open up the, uh, this environment right here, and if I open up the biomes, I basically just instantiated a prefab and then take, let's say, I'll take like the rocks. And if I look at where that's placed and I look at the helpers here, and I, I have a box here. You, it's hard to see. Let me open this up. But basically, I, I just in this level, I just detached the prefab. Hopefully, this doesn't crash the editor. But I, I detached the prefab, and I just take the 32 meter box, delete it, and remove that reference, and replace it with the larger world box. Um, and so that's basically what I've done for each of these layers in here. So I'm gonna delete this one, because I have all three here. And so each of these layers I expanded into the larger terrain. And then I wanted to control the placement. So if we go look at the succulents biome layer, here's where you'll see that, um, what I was describing when I was rebooting the editor is that we have a vegetation asset list that loads four objects, a barrel cactal, cactus, Neves eetle, prickly pear, snake's tongue. But if I wanna make this even more sparse, I could just add another entry and say empty, and then if I go back to my layer spawner component, I have allow empty assets field, which if you hover over it, says allow shapes, modifiers, whoops, I'm sorry, it's the one below it. Allow unspecified asset references in the descriptor to claim space and block other vegetation, so I turned that off. So I'm creating a sparser selection of things to place by creating empty space, but then the rocks or the grass can come in and fill it later. So the other thing is, here's where I can show you um, the previous question that was asked, where I've created a tube shape. Let me open this up. I've created a tube shape um, that allowed me to make a path from this clearing to the pyramid, or whatever you want to call it, the ancient alien base. Um, and I've created a cylinder, right? And I've used those to modify the train. You can see that it's divoted. If I go look at the train layer, the base terrain layer here, let me open the landscape canvas for it. Um, so what you can see here, this graph suddenly got more complex. But what I've done here is I've taken my tube shape, and I've taken my cylinder shape, and I've combined them in a compound shape, and then that compound shape is being passed through a shape fall off, which creates a fuzzy mask, right? And then I can take that fuzzy mask, and I can blend it with the other data. So here you can see I've used that as a subtraction mixed with our fast noise, and that's how I create divots in the ground. Um, is I basically say, I just want to remove height in this area. And then I can take that information and I can bake it out and I can go all the way out of system back to something like Gaia. Let me open up this last level. I have 10 minutes. I want to leave some more time for Q&A. Um, if I open up this last level right here, you can see that I... I've gone even further, like an even more complex graph. 
but you can see that I've taken that height field where I baked that information with the divot in, and I've used that to make even more interesting um, texturing. So what you'll see here is uh, I brought that mask in itself, and I used it to start baking information into the texturing. So here I can make the area where that shape is darker just by doing composition in this graph. And then I'm, here's the final color map that, um, I'm, that I've written out. And you can see I've also modified the normal map. And along the way, I've created splat maps. So I could use this information to be like, oh, I want to specifically plot, apply sandy dirt to this area of the terrain. Um, or in this case, maybe I want a, a mask that defines that, um, that dirt area in the divots, which I've actually done. So if we go back to the editor here and I hide these helpers, if you look up close here, you could see I brought in a third material, uh, which is rocky dirt, and that blends into the larger um, rocky sand material, which then blends into our sandy peaks material. So I've made a co more complex world. But I've also shared that data because you'll see that not only did I use that area to describe where to place the dirt material, I used it to remove height information. And I've used it to say, I don't want any grass or any cacti to be placed in this area. And the way that those things are set up is that um, I can grab my succulent biome. We're going to grab its vegetation layer here. And I can add a component that's called a surface mask filter. And this has two sets of rules. One's an inclusion list, and one's an exclusion list. And the inclusion list, in this case, says, hey, I want to tell you where I can place succulents. And in this case, I can place succulents anywhere that is defined as terrain, which is this entire world. And then I've come in and I've said, but I don't want to place succulents anywhere that's described as dirt, which is where this road is. And I don't want to place succulents anywhere that is described as Sandy Peak, because that's where I'm going to place the grass. And so I've cleared those areas using this rule right here. And that allows the rocks to come in and fill that empty space. So I'm done. Any questions before we're done? I can take maybe one. Yeah. Um, just curious, the way you populated the terrain with grass before, um, it was, there was empty space in between them, which you said was because it was sampling from the grid. If you wanted to make that grass closer together, would that just require more, a tighter grid, more grid sampling points if you wanted to say like, like a typical house lawn without dirt showing? Yeah, there's two ways to do that. One is to make larger patches of grass. Yeah. So the, the flatter your terrain, the larger your placed objects can be, and there's rules for like aligning to the surface. But in, in this case, you could also just go change the sector point density, right? So it depends on how big a sector is, how many sectors are being placed, and how many things are being placed within the sector. You have all those controls right here in the vegetation system component. So Thank I you. can make things dense very quickly. I can also crash the GPU really quickly by doing that. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think that's it for my presentation. If anyone has any additional questions or would like more information, feel free to hit me up at the conference.